Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Home Modification Occupational Therapy Alliance meeting, HOMODA. Um, we are very fortunate to have Richard Duncan here from the RL NACE um, Institute of Universal Design. So welcome, Richard. Um, before we get going, um, I want to just talk a little bit about um, our sponsor, which tonight is Essential Luxuries. Uh, Essential Luxuries um, is also uh, a big part of Homoda. So for Essential Luxuries, um, Essential Luxuries does home modification fixtures. Um, they're always looking for some for new and unique. So tonight we're going to highlight one of the um, Essential Luxuries pieces of equipment called Comfort Arms. So Comfort Arms are um, armrests for the toilet. They're very stable, they're very sturdy. Um, they're easy to put on. The way, the, um, in order to install the comfort arms, there's comfort arms again. Again, they just look like, uh, arm, they're just armrests for the toilet. And what these armrests do is they've got the metal plate that goes on the top of the bowl, the basin of the toilet, and then they just attach in the back. And then the arm height is adjustable. They're much more, um, they're easier, obviously, to install than um, grab bars, and they're uh, they're a lot more stable than anything else on the market that attaches to the toilet. So when you attach them to the toilet, uh, just real quick, you remove the seats, put the comfort arms, position the base plate on the toilet itself, then reinstall the mounting bolts along with the toilet seat. And then I always recommend putting um, silicone all the way around so that way it just keeps it um, from getting dirty underneath the comfort arms themselves. And then you just put the, uh, the arms of the comfort arms, just they slide right onto the receptacles that are on the top of the, um, the metal plate that goes around the toilet. And voila. Comfort arms. Uh, comfort arms come in two sizes, regular and extra wide, and they're only good for um, people up to 330 pounds. If they're over 330 pounds, then things, um, then it's it's not acceptable for this piece of equipment. So, these are comfort arms. Armrests for the toilet. Um, does any and then if um, and those are sold on essential luxuries. And then if you go to the Comfort Arms page on Essential Luxuries and you scroll down, um, you can even see a video on how to install them, which they're very easy to install. You probably wouldn't even need the video. So that's Comfort Arms for you. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce everyone um, and again say welcome to the Homoda meeting tonight. Uh, but I'd like to introduce you to Richard Duncan. Uh, he's going to be talking to us tonight about the better living design. <clears throat> Thanks um, so much for having me back again, Karen. I, I was, we were talking a week or so ago, and I was last here in the fall of 2016 to talk to folks with a kind of a general introduction to our view on what the world of universal design was. And so Karen and I have been talking off and on this fall, and uh, figured out that. Um, maybe it's a good time to get back and talk to people about a narrower frame of reference, which is just the Better Living Design Institute and its work, which is uh, kind of a subset of the general world of uh, universal design. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, and I should I should mention something at, at the outset. Um, <clears throat> um, we're all, um, universal home from Seattle. I'll tell you a couple of stories to start us out. Um, uh, they're both fairly recent. The first was just from last week. Um, I got a uh, message from a colleague who was attending uh, the IBS show in Orlando. It's the International Builders Show. And if people haven't been there, it's once a year. It's a gigantic, vast, uh, awe-inspiring, intimidating show that has every home product manufacturer under the sun, really from around the world, literally, um, there and all kinds of builders and designers are are hanging around, so it's just you know tens of thousands of people, um, and this is a colleague who's down there who um, knows a little bit about accessible and universal design. And, and her message to me was, you know, Richard, uh, 
these people really don't know the difference between accessible and universal design. I'm really, you know, shocked and disappointed. And I was disheartened to hear that, but in, in, in 2018, I wasn't surprised because while we've been working maybe for the past 20 years to refine the messaging we put out about what universal design is and what accessible design is and why the difference matters, um, we um, uh, haven't always been successful in communicating. We're getting a lot of background noise here. If you're here, somebody, somebody should go on mute. Should go on mute. That sounds better. Okay, sorry. Um, so anyway, so she reported that even in 2018, in her estimation, the, the the folks down at that show that she was able to talk to didn't really have a good, a clean grasp about what the difference was, and that difference is fundamental to our creating the Better Living Design Institute. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. So the second story is uh, uh, fairly recent, it was last fall. I was in Missouri working with a local group to help them um, propel kind of their um, interest in uh, setting up a, a universal housing initiative in their area. Um, they kind of got the message on universal design, saw its benefits and wanted to figure out ways to promote that locally. Um, and that was very successful. Uh, I happened to, at one time during the, the couple of days I was there, have a, a, a side conversation with one of the staff people at the organization who was the person who used a wheelchair. And he was describing for me his a two year long journey at, um, at getting in the, an accessible house. Um, he decided uh, that the home he was in really didn't work out that well for him, wasn't really adapted to the extent he needed it to be, was uh, no longer meeting his needs. And so went out looking for um, an accessible house that he could move into in his area. Um, and for a year, you know, looking pretty much far and wide, uh, could not find one. And then after finally changing his criteria to, okay, maybe I can find a house that is, is easier to adapt than my own home, looked extensively for that, could not find that either. Um, and so finally wound up turning his focus back on his existing home, which is where he is now, and spent a fair amount of money adapting that. And that was a, it's a sad story, one that um, I and maybe a lot of you have heard a number of times, just that there isn't very much housing stock out there that's built uh, for accessibility, um, and certainly not a lot out there that's built for universal design as I've defined it and, and as I'll continue to kind of make you aware of over the course of this uh, time time together. Um, uh, uh, so unfortunately, the problem my colleague had in Orlando at IBS contributes to the problem that uh, our, our colleague in, in Missouri had not been able to find a home. People really don't know what to build. They don't know what the market is. They don't know how to build it. Um, then consumers may not be able to identify it readily in the marketplace and kind of vote with their dollars and vote with their feeder wheels, so to speak, to um, to select them. And we found this um, over the decades, uh, a common confusion that a builder will think he's building kind of mainstream housing or housing that meets this huge, large market of folks who could take advantage of it. And actually what they're building is a house that looks substantially more like an accessible home than really a universally designed home, a home that otherwise um, you know, is marketable to a mainstream audience, it still has substantial um, elements of, uh, of increased functionality there. Um, and so it's that problem that we were trying to solve, both of those problems with setting up the Better Living Design Institute, um, is, to, is to create our own definition of what a universally designed home is, separate the confusions with, with universal design, which people have, uh, I think these days, variously described as a euphemism for kind of all things accessible or what good looking accessible design is or what ADA design is and so on. Forget all that stuff. Take BLD, um, Better Living Design, as a subset of universal design. Define it ourselves in the way we know is most useful and actually correct with the origins of the term. Um, and then go from there so that we can't, uh, others can't misinterpret it because we're the ones who are controlling the messaging for that. So our goal with the Institute, which we set up about six years ago, is to increase the production of universally newly constructed and remodeled homes. So it goes each way. You can, um, you know, have a house that has universal features, um, whether you're building new or whether you're remodeling. It really just depends upon how you're, how you're starting out doing it. Um, and th the big deal about this, um, which we think if people had adopted this long ago, we'd have much more of this stuff on the market, is that while they have 
critical functional improvements that differentiate themselves from um, otherwise standard homes in the marketplace, which you'll, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, uh, a key feature is that the home has to be marketable to a mainstream audience and as well has to be easy to modify and inexpensive to customize. So uh, BLD home, um, in fact, isn't the same thing as a home that's 100% uh, accessible to someone who uses a wheelchair or has a serious mobility, uh, a mobility impairment. Um, but it is one that is substantially accessible, and but for some customizations, which lots of people need to make anyway, um, it's a fully functional home. Um, there's some exceptions, and we'll and we'll talk about that. But if homes are built like this that were marketable to this mainstream audience, then our goal would be to have production home builders pick it up and you'd find uh, homes like this built all over the place because they'd have all these advantages over other homes, price competitive, um, and uh, uh, you know would work well for, for people today and as well as tomorrow. You'd have people uh, being readily accepting a remodeler's suggestion that they tweak their kitchen design plans or their deck design plans in a few small ways to improve functionality over time. Um, and knowing that they could have a home that looks like every other house in the neighborhood, just happens to work a lot better. Um, so that's the idea with uh, with better living design and what we're kind of trying to um, promote as much as we can. So I thought it was the time to kind of bring it to you folks. And I know that for some of you, I'm not quite sure about all of the audience here, some of you um, uh, may not deal with you know, new construction every day or may deal somewhat more in your professional life with the customization kind of features that we're that we're talking about, but um, I think this is a uh, maybe appropriate context, something for you to know about going forward. Um, you'll certainly be hearing from us again. So, um, as I said, we're trying to tackle these problems of confusion of definition, both on the supply side and the and the demand side, um, and which results in this limited amount of this housing that's that's being built. So we know that there's a big need. We know that in terms of people can take immediate advantage of the features that might be in a BLD house. The demographics are clear. I've talked about them before. I'll mention a little bit later on. Um, that's kind of a present market. And we also know that whether you, uh, even if you put aside the aging sector or the folks who have disabling conditions, you know, the mass of other folks can take immediate advantage of all the features in better living design as well. So um, there's there's no shortage of folks who might make the selection. We know there's a limited supply. My friend's example and probably the examples in your lives um, would uh, would support that. But I think crucially, there's a limited demand. Is that uh, people aren't voting with their dollars in the marketplace when they do see this. They aren't in sufficient numbers to change the marketplace. Going to their builder, their architect, their interior designer, Home Depot. Lowe's, wherever, and saying, I'd like to have this stuff, and I know what I'm talking about. I've heard it 20 times, and I want to you know, vote to have this done. So um, because of that, because the so many of the attempts by builders over the years um, have not met with the kind of rousing success that we'd like to see and that they would, you know, people maybe not don't stay in the market that long and move on to do other things. So we're, we, would, we would love to have a, 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 a big and bigger impact on the actually demand side of things as well. That's a, a difficult challenge uh, just because the uh, l that let lift is pretty substantial of uh, kind of shifting public opinion, but it's something that we're still working on. So in terms of progress over the past maybe 20, 25 years, I think we can say with a fair amount of certainty that in the custom home area, which is admittedly a very small segment of high priced and luxury homes, that um, that more and more people are are creating homes that are accessible. Clearly, um, uh, you know, folks are out there. We can see examples of them all the time. You see books published. You see um, articles that, uh, that mention accessibility. And I think the word is out there that people are in are increasingly um, unwilling to kind of put up with inappropriate homes, and uh, if they've got a, a particular substantial human performance issue. Um, they're willing to, to pay for an accessible home. We know that some uh, UD homes in this category also are being built because we've worked with people, we see them all the time as well. Uh, not so many, but some. Um, and I think far more we see combo homes, um, which have maybe some universal design features, some accessibility features because of the inevitable customizations of the home, um, but are kind of blended in combinations of both of those things. So in the custom area, there's some action and some activity, certainly more than than 25 years ago. 
Um, in the age targeted area, this is the other sector we see some substantial uh, movement in this area. Um, and you can see for these age targeted, age restricted communities, um, they're doing a better job, not a perfect job, not a terrific job, but a better job over the past 25 years in, in accommodating the obvious reality that people are moving in and the inevitable changes they'll be experiencing over the time that they're living there. So um, we, we, we see some universal design features, some accessibility features, and some of this housing that's out there, they've done a better job. It's it's the only substantial sector um, of, uh, of the general purpose uh, housing market that we see some movement in. Um, so that's good. Um, we, we like that. We're, we're more, much more about people aging in, in their communities, um, in community housing as opposed to in institutional or quasi-institutional or age-segregated settings, but fine. We know that for some folks, those are choices they want to make. And we hey, like Richard. to have a housing more appropriate. Richard, yes. um, the PowerPoint is, is still on the first slide. Oh, dear. Okay, well, we can try this, but my apologies. Um, so here's all the great slides you missed. Here's our goal for BLD, <laughs> increased production of universally, universally newly constructed remodel homes. There's our, um, our shorthand definition of what a BLD home is with critical functional improvements that are marketable to the mainstream audience that are easy and inexpensive to customize. So I will take this opportunity to kind of redo this since we're going over it again. <clears throat> Our focus is mainstream audiences. Um, it really isn't like the, for example, the custom home audience or any subset of that. It's and we define mainstream audiences, audiences of folks who uh, who have no consciousness or awareness of their own changing abilities over time, or the fact that their home can help with those. Um, who have no consciousness or awareness of the needs of aging people, either themselves or people around them and who fear aging and fear disability. This is kind of what we've learned is the standard status of most folks. They simply don't want people to talk to them about the realities of their own lives or even their family's lives. Um, the further away from their own person you talk about, the more comfortable they are. Um, you can talk about neighbors and, and, and uh, colleagues, but please, it's not gonna be happening to them. So that's why we've kind of abandoned having to, trying to change people's minds about that. And we've reverted to better living design, which doesn't require you to talk about their own issues. It just says, look at this nice house with all these nice features you can take advantage of now. And oh, by the way, um, some folks might respond if they've got a consciousness of a certain type to some of the, the, the persuasive, um, arguments that you may see later on in this in this show but we've we've kind of abandoned that because it seems like our research and the the overwhelming response in the marketplace that we know nationally is that that folks just don't respond to it so we're we're kind of getting to people where they're at so here's our our big need limited supply limited demand which is always the big problem if people were demanding it you know um, with a clear message we could um, make some uh, progress with that and here's our custom home array of accessible UD and combo homes, which we have some more of lately. And then we have the age targeted category, which I think this is where we stopped and I had to back up with that. Um, and I have multifamily housing listed here, it's kind of special because it is a special category. And I've been over the last couple of years made more aware of some of the real potential this has. We, we think about you know, the housing needs of folks who are older. We think about the housing needs of people who have disabilities. And um, I had my first experience of actually living in a recently constructed multi-housing, um, multi-unit housing project over the past couple of years as uh, world headquarters for UDI and my family moved from place A to place B. Uh, and we, we camped out for a while in, a, uh, in an apartment. And it was an interesting experience. It was extremely diverse amount of folks, a lot of movement coming and going as perhaps is the case with the lots of apartment complexes. Um, recently built and was frankly uh, pretty well done from the perspective of complying with the Federal Fair Housing Amendments Act, which means that the apartment that we were in had a step-free route of travel from the parking lot. There were accessible parking spaces and complying with state law in North Carolina. It also had an array of fully accessible apartments. We actually had people living in our apartment complex who unbelievably use wheelchairs, use power wheelchairs, manual chairs. It was quite a diverse group. And what we've heard from other multifamily housing builders in this area, and maybe you've heard this elsewhere, is that 
in some places, uh, newly built particularly, because they're probably, probably comply better with the design provisions of the Act, um, multifamily housing projects are in some cases becoming the residence of choice for older households for whom the capital outlay of buying a home or buying into a CCRC or some kind of senior targeted project may not be within their means, but monthly payments for an apartment would be. Um, it actually isn't a bad choice. It's an interesting uh, kind of evolution here as, uh, as this kind of housing stock could work better for more folks over a longer period of time within a particular economic strata. So I thought I'd mention that you can, you know, keep a lookout for yourselves and maybe you have your own experience with this, but I thought that was an interesting thing. We spend a lot of time talking about um, one, two, and three family housing, which is really what Better Living Design Institute focuses on, which is most of what's out there, most of what's built, most of what um, people kind of aspire to, but the multifamily housing sector may fill an important niche um, in a not terrible way. There's all kinds of problems and issues with that, but nevertheless, um, we think it's useful to mention. So there's our, our nicely designed, uh, newly built multifamily housing project with lots of built-in, maybe not perfect, but built-in accessibility features and convenience features that work better, we think, for a far wider range of folks um, than most of the one, two, and three family housing that's built out there these days, for sure. So that's just a kind of stick a pin in that one. Um, so moving into the remodeled home area, we also see these three three areas. We see some homes, not many, being uh, remodeled for universal design, vastly more for accessibility. I mean, people are are willing in many more cases to build the ramp on their house, to put the lift in, to remodel the bathroom or widen the doorway, um, to customize their home for a family member's needs, which is uh, un unsurprising. In a fairly few cases, you've got combination homes where you've got some uh, features that are actually universal could survive and could be remarketed to a mainstream family, as well as uh, features that are, that are that are customized. I think it's probably more of those than than probably any of the UD stuff out there um, solo. So we still got this limited limited supply. We know that the demographics are overwhelming, but just still not as much happening as everyone would like to see. Um, I don't know if people remember if they've seen any of these slides before, but this is just a few examples that kind of illustrate the kinds of homes we'd like to see more of in a better living design context. Um, in this case, we've got um, a house that's had a, an entire front um, porch put on. This is a, a house that had uh, no porch, no roof, um, no weather protection. Uh, it had a step down, as most homes do, from doorway to, to stairs that went down, and the clever builder um, uh, brought in some earth, realized that there was a gentle sloping pathway waiting to be crafted, and um, and and I think rather elegantly put this uh, roof on and converted, you know, in, in a remodeling situation from a house that was, in my opinion, frankly, very undistinguished to one that looks a lot nicer to begin with and works for a far wider range of folks as well. So you have the gentle sloping pathway, no ramps, no visually... Um, obstructive uh, handrails, um, although they can be added later on, frankly, and then to a porch that's level with the first floor that also has weather protection. So that's a great, newly constructed, it would be fine. Uh, in, a, in a remodeling, it's it's uh, fairly extraordinary. We actually um, have this on our website as being a, a, an award-winning entry design. Um, so I've, I've kind of <laughs> done away in the production new home area. Um, accessible uh, homes and combo homes and UD homes, not much at all in those areas. Some in the in the affordable housing area. We find that when you get down into those areas where you've got some federal requirements, in some cases state requirements, and uh, with subsidized housing, that uh, interestingly, those kinds of homes, sometimes it's apartments, sometimes uh, uh, for purchase, uh, may have um, uh, some UD features, some accessibility features that you just aren't finding in the standard market rate homes that we're used to seeing and buying and most of us live in. Um, it so happened that uh, my circumstance was a little bit like this fellow's I mentioned at the beginning of the of the talk, <clears throat> who was himself looking for an accessible house because he was using a wheelchair himself. Well, 
uh, when we moved out to where we are now, which is in Asheville, we were looking for what might be, you know, our our long-term lifetime home and did a similar search. All the homes in the area, any universally designed? Well, of course not. Uh, we didn't even see any that were excessively designed that weren't in the multifamily housing context, but did find a condo, um, finally, that met all these complex criteria, you know, location, price, size, amenities, um, and uh, interestingly is is adaptable. It's almost debt free entrance in, large master bath that's easily, well, relatively easily adapted, and open space, you know, open plan interior that makes it easy to, to get around in. So uh, we were lucky, I guess, in finding one of the few opportunities that was affordable for us in the area. This poor fellow who I mentioned earlier was not able to find anything like that. So um, I, I can tell firsthand what the challenges are in looking for that. Um, I provided Karen with a couple of handouts um, today that um, I don't know how she's going to get them to you, but one of them has to do with um, kind of a guideline for consumers faced with this problem. You know you're not going to find a UD house. You know you're not going to find an accessible house. Well, how can you look for, what do you look for in a house that maybe is more adaptable for lifetime living. So we've actually got that in a very shorthanded infographic manner kind of sketched out. So folks can look for that, I guess, later on. Karen can figure out how to get that in people's hands. Um, this is a home that we helped design a few years ago. Let me see if I can actually, can I improve this? Uh, Ooh, you almost did it. Okay, that's better. A little bit. Okay, I'm trying Esther, to enlarge the. Um, to Esther, I don't know if you can have your make your microphone work, but she said to hit the slideshow button at the bottom. Yeah, that's what I was doing before that oh. paused it instantly. Yeah. Hit the slideshow and it goes. Burp. I'll try it again. We we can we can toggle back. Yeah, paused immediately. Yeah. All right. Darn. Reason it goes into pause mode. Um. Okay. Anyway, so th this is a. Um, you know, I don't have any interior shots handy right here with this, but this is a standard home that looks like all the others in the neighborhood, which is kind of the idea. Um, we really aren't crazy about uh, universal homes that stand out like a sore thumb. Um, we want to have them blend in as much as possible. And you see a short set of stairs going up to the front porch. The front porch is level with the first floor. Um, the the front door is protected from the weather by the the roof. Um, all works very well. They've got an attached garage and a bonus room upstairs. Otherwise, it's a one-floor living house, um, and there's a gentle sloping pathway that goes from the driveway up to the first floor, up to the porch, rather, um, that works out perfectly. Um, and so this is a great example of, you know, if you could you know, pick a home that was like other homes in the neighborhood that, that looked the same, that blended, but had all these additional features, this would be a good example. And you could basically repeat that theme at any price point um, and in a lot of different train circumstances as well. So we like that. Let me see if I can do this. Um, so we do have barriers to this though. We'll talk about this going forward. Um, and as we found out from IBS, we have home builder expertise and designer expertise that are certainly there. We don't currently have a whole lot in the financial incentive area, at least not in replicable models. That's what other colleagues of ours are paying a lot of attention to now is how can we incent on a national basis, uh, both builders and, uh, and, and, and home purchasers and remodelers to, to, to jump into this. We don't really have any government involvement now that affects that. We wish we, we could, um, but profoundly we have the, the the, the single lever that could change everything is just lack of consumer awareness and demand. Um, so we're working to change all those things. There may be other issues. There are many other issues, in fact, but these are some key ones that we see the keeping this happening. So yeah, what we like to say is everybody with unit with better living design is a winner. Um, it's a, <laughs> it's um, it's one of these things where um, we. Uh, we uh, you know, think that it's really difficult for someone to look at a BLD house and say, wow, I really don't really like that step-free entrance. I would rather you know, climb stairs every time I come and go, or I really don't like the blocking behind the bathroom walls to put a grab bar someplace later on. I mean, it's, it's tough to, to get that um, argument made or to have that teased out. It's really just more attitudinal in different ways than maybe presentation as well. Um, but this is where I tell my joke that there are three kinds of people uh, in the world, those who can count 
and those who can't. Um, and uh, what that really is a lead in to say is there's actually two kinds of people. There are people who benefit every day from living in a house with universal design features, and there are people who really benefit every day from living in a house with universal design features. And I don't think there's any other categories because everybody kind of does one way or the other. So we'll go through, you know, a couple of couple of samples here. Um, so here's our, our young family. We would love to have these guys be buying BLD homes uh, because we think that they'd like it. They could take advantage of maybe the set free entry route uh, for bringing, um, you know, the grocery basket up and down or bringing the kids bicycles up onto the porch easily or any number of things, you know, just kind of everyday stuff that doesn't really call attention to itself, but it's all kind of built in. Or in a family like like this, maybe, you know, mom and dad are visiting from somewhere and they can kind of easily take advantage of these um, built-in handholds in the bathroom, not really grab bars, just kind of handholds that make a difference in their lives. But, you know, it's kind of an everyday thing for them. They don't have to think much about it, just kind of there for them to use um, and no big deal. And this is really our toughest um, crowd, isn't it? The folks who are right in the middle facing, you know, um, personal changes uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a major way who seem to have a remarkable degree of, of um, uh, lack of awareness about what might be helpful to them. Um, and even folks like that can take advantage of the features, whether it's at free entrance or the simple uh, handholds in the, in the bathroom or the added handrails on the stairs, you know, no big deal, makes a difference. You don't notice that it. it's all integrated and designed in, but it's great for you to have. Uh, here we have someone, um, you know, carrying their arms full of groceries. We've all been in this circumstance before using the lever handle on the front door um, with their elbow because it's difficult to get that knob turned with all those groceries. I mean, just everyday stuff um, where, you, where BLD stuff can make a big difference. And here's folks who can really benefit every day from living in a house with universal design features. Oh, same family, here we go. So these are the folks who maybe dad has blown his knee out playing basketball on the weekend. And um, uh, and he's really grateful now that there's a master bedroom on the first floor with a bathroom large enough to accommodate him and his whatever splint he's gonna be acquiring as a result of doing that. So he's really gonna benefit living in there. Uh, same family again, maybe mom and dad go back to their unadapted traditional home and mom falls on the stairs and maybe breaks a hip. Uh, they come home to the, the kid's house and they can recover there because it's set free entrances and um, they can have room in the bathroom for a, a bath seat or a shower seat or something much more accommodating. They can really take advantage of those features every day. Here's our motorcyclist. This is actually modeled on a friend of mine as a motorcyclist that I showed this slideshow to. And this is what happens after he steers the wrong way. And goes, if he's lucky, this is all that happens. So, you know, stuff can happen to anybody at any time, um, young, old, in between. And, uh, and having the kinds of features that we have in the house um, can make a big difference, whether it's illness, injury, um, male, female, um, doesn't make any difference. Um, everyone can can benefit every day or really benefit. And here's the guy who kind of most people got to think of reflexively. Oh, this is a guy using a wheelchair. Yeah, of course he can really, but yeah, he can really benefit and, and all as well as all the other people. Maybe this guy is the, is the, uh, is the homemaker of, 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 of the house and he can go into maybe a BLD house and adapt in a relatively simple way, the bath counter and sink area at you know, fraction of the dollars compared to changing the doorway and changing all the fixtures would be otherwise to customize it for him. Maybe he does have to go in the kitchen to make some changes in the cabinetry and counters. Um, much less of a big deal when he's got all these other things built in um, uh, that, that are already in place, that are already existing in the home. So yeah, you either benefit every day or you really benefit every day and ev eventually people will find out the difference. Um, so back to our little house in um, in Seattle. If you haven't seen this before, and maybe I, I showed this uh, a year and a half ago, but um, may, maybe you've forgotten. This is a, a teardown <clears throat> um, project of an architect colleague of ours out there. Um, and there's a step-free entrance going in the front door. The front door is good weather protected. Um, this does not have... Um, uh, a master bedroom on the first floor. It does have stacked closets though, which I think I'll show you an image of later on. So that eventually you could 
add an elevator shaft at much lower cost. Um, so planning ahead, um, building features in now that are useful that can be easily adapted or more cheaply adapted later on can make a big difference. Um, and this is a three-story house. The elevator can reach eventually all three stories. And maybe someday they'll need to have that. So just to kind of restate this. And so obviously kind of go through these these lists. These are great arguments. These are great policy arguments. Um, I think individual households really don't care that much about this, but it's good for us to know. You know, people have some physical or sensory limitation, folks with hidden disabilities, families, friends, I mean, really anything can happen to anybody. And then the kind of boring issue of average people in poor circumstances, you know, carrying groceries in your hand, going in the front door, um, happens to everybody every day. And on and on and on. Women who are pregnant, folks with temporary disabilities, delivery people, everybody. That's kind of the the, the broad uh, breadth that, that we uh, look at uh, with uh, with the with the audience that we're looking at for for better living design homes. And people have seen all these statistics before. You've seen um, you know the the large population of folks with disabling conditions, the aging population. The demographic changes that will continue to the middle of the century, um, and the fact that it's a, frankly an international phenomenon. Lots of lots of other countries are looking at the same issues. Some responding a little bit more effectively than others. I'll just make a make a side note here. Norway has come up lately in the uh, in the national international news. Norway is a country that's officially adopted universal design as its national policy. So you can look to there. So maybe we should go to Norway instead of them migrating here, who knows. Um, I felt compelled to show this to you. This is one of these human scale charts, charts that's uh, really creepy and weird. Um, it's one of the weirdest ones I've ever seen, but I was trying to find one that I could, you know, could, could display the range of human form. And the longer I looked at this, um, I went from thinking that this was maybe kind of a casting sheet for a alien invasion movie to perhaps um, uh, some human form that looks a little bit more like us than we'd be comfortable thinking that we look like. Uh, I'm not quite sure. There's some really tall people and some kind of squat wide people, which I'm uh, kind of looking a little more like maybe than I'd care to. Anyway, um, this just is a visual uh, reminder of the of the of the breadth and the, the normal distribution of uh, people's sizes and shapes and human performance characteristics that we think BLD homes accommodate. So the, it, obviously built off of universal design, as I said, better living design focusing on one, two, and three family homes is really channeling universal design, the definition, um, down just into that particular sector of the built environment. Some of the things we talk about because they're, they're so specialized in housing uh, don't really apply necessarily all that well um, to other areas of the built environment, but certainly here, design of all products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for specialized design is a good working definition. And if any of you care to look at the actual principles, which were derived back in 1997, um, you can look at principle one guideline D and it says, you know, marketable, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, marketable to a, a wide, as, as wide an audience as possible. So that's the, the key differentiation between kind of things accessible and things universal. It's got to be marketable to a wide audience. Built in, integrated, not special, not different, not occasional. So you've seen that weather protection. You've seen, and there's lots and lots of examples of things that aren't universal design, aren't better, better living design. And, you know, ramps are an obvious um, example of that as well. Functional, accessible, but you know, it's not going to hang around very long um, once occupancy changes there. Um, and we see our house there again. We see the interior of this house with the stacked closet on the third floor, which is now a sitting area for grandma and grandchild to work in, and, um, and them descending the stairs, which has added lighting and has handrails on both sides. Well, at least handle rails on, on, on one side. I don't see handrails on the other side of this picture. Um, and tightly wrapped carpeting around the stairs and the stair nosing, which is also really important not to get loose, wide radius, slippery carpeting. Um, that can be a problem for folks. So um, not a perfect out of the box house with all your living spaces and key function areas on the main level, which is what we prefer, but does a pretty good job of you know, long-term adaptability at a lower price point by allowing for, because um, you know, of the sizing and shaping of that shaft, you can put an elevator in there later on if you want to. Um, 
whether it's you know a one-story house or multiple story houses and you know you can obviously I've shown you a three-story house in the prior pictures uh, a lot of people think that well universal house has to be one story not not really you can have all kinds of spaces off the main level as long as the key function areas are reachable on one level if at all possible with the exceptions I've noted so kitchen needs to be on that level a usable bathroom and usable bedroom um, principally and then also you need to have your laundry that's at a place that's reachable at least can be relocated to that and I'll go into some of the details about this later on if we have time we'll see should I pause here for questions um, I don't know if people have can use their uh, actually I can't see the chat can I see the chat okay <laughs> I, I, so I'm not um, Okay, I see people commenting, and I'm sorry I have not been looking at this. I had that had that window <laughs> toggled. Yeah, there's um, there's not a whole lot. Um, although Charles Schwab said, and I thought this was interesting, um, and I agreed with that. Charles, uh, multifamily is a realistic approach and place for younger families to experience universal design. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and as I said that. It was, you know, the the experience that we had was went went far beyond the 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 you know, kind of bare limitations of just design stuff. It's just it was a cultural experience that was different from that we'd had since maybe I was in college or living in the city in Boston or something. With just the diversity of people of all kinds, young families, uh, old singles, uh, older singles, you know, uh, couples without kids, um, and then us with grandkids. You know, that's all that stuff going going on there. And Charles, I should talk to you later on. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll give you a call. <laughs> um, see what you're doing. Anyway, um, so this 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 illustration that we're seeing with circulation is, is, is by no means a perfect home. If you can look closely, you see neither of the bathrooms are really very well designed. So this is not an example of the perfect home with your circulation paths designed throughout. It's really very modestly sized home. It's not large, obviously, one floor. You have entrance and exits that are um, that are step free um, and, and room to maneuver, but you could certainly do a much better job in those bathrooms than we're showing here. So please don't take that to heart as a as a, as an example of everything uh, good in in, in design. Um, I've said before, and we and we say often that you know that that um, there's lots of different flavors of better living design type homes. Um, it's not all one cookie cutter size and and we make some exceptions and some variability uh, in in particular circumstances so this is the interior of a very narrow deep footprint house a two-story house um, happens to be in Atlantic City New Jersey that does not have a separate bedroom downstairs and in fact in the back left corner of the house um, uh, is a two fixture bath that we designed that could be converted to a three fixture bath with a maybe a wet area floor for a shower if you needed to, if someone had to remain downstairs. But we also designed a straight run set of stairs so that you could put the least expensive um, uh, seat left on. And we designed the second floor so that it would be as usable as well. So while it isn't perfect, it does have some built-in features that makes the customizations and the functionality of it um, improved over time. I don't know that I've got any more shots of I may have another shot inside we'll come back to that later on but this is just an example so that the seat lift is obviously a piece of assistive technology not universal design you add it when someone needs so you never buy a house and and stick this in if you didn't have to but um, you can put AT in later and put all kinds of customizations in later in BLD homes at a much lower cost because you've been thinking about it ahead of time and the house is perfectly fine without it um, you know storage is a big deal for lots of folks and fortunately in kitchens, you can have a, a whole array of storage options that go beyond just, you know, wall cabinets, base cabinets. I mean, it's just the, the options now are almost limitless in what you can do with pantry style storage and storage that comes out to you um, can be rather costly if you want to go to the high end stuff, but you can still get basic, um, I think, convenience features that work well. This is a photograph we, we've stolen and used often from our friends at uh, ARP that's just kind of a very base level kind of a, what might a BLD kitchen. Uh, unlike bathrooms, we know the kitchens are among the most uh, difficult rooms in the house to convert 
for different users. To convert from a user that's ambulatory to a primary homemaker that's seated, if you want to have a 100% conversion, it, it can cost a fair amount of money because the lowered counters, different cabinets, um, and all kinds of other things have to be accommodated. Uh, so we're not actually attempting um, the complete kind of combination for that because we know that it's just like a big dividing line but a kitchen like this one has you know extra space between cabinet faces has kind of okay cabinet hardware lighting under the wall cabinets which we like looks like it's a smooth topped cooktop um, and one lowered counter area that is will clearly be multifunction over many years mom or grandmom right now you know, maybe prefers sitting instead of standing any longer, so works great for her. Uh, mom can do whatever work she might have to do uh, with her computer there. Eventually, the kids will be doing their homework there. And while we don't advocate children playing with toys on the kitchen floor near hot pans, um, it could accommodate them if people wanted to and were bold enough to make that that happen. You also see in this particular image, um, you know, wall ovens, and so separating your cooktops from your wall ovens or from your your ovens in general does give you more opportunities um, for placement and for height customization to make it easier for folks to reach so very base level stuff doesn't have to be fancy or eye popping all integrated you never look at this and say wow this is you know accommodating folks who are older or multi-generational families it just looks like a nice kitchen well that's kind of the idea other end of the spectrum perfectly nice kitchen um, clearly designed for someone who is the who is the homemaker who is seated with some odd, you know, side features that I'll just have to mention. I'll feel compelled to mention that the the odd, very deep sink that's there, perhaps because there is no cabinets beneath adjacent countertops. They thought that maybe a person could slip knees under left or under right and still use that, but it, it generally violates what we know to be, you know, depth requirements and restrictions on sinks if you're going to slide your knees underneath. Um, but it, clearly not a universal design kitchen and a, a customized kitchen and one that would may work fine for um, someone who's operates from a seated position um, but that's the distinction we're drawing uh, and again very very difficult to have a kitchen do double duty unless it's very large and you've got you you, you can afford kind of doubled um, features in there um, there's lots of uh, lots of uh, equipment out there that you could get that can can ergonomically accommodate a wide range of people. You can get, you know, bathroom sinks that go up and down. You can get toilets that go up and down. You can get cabinets, base cabinets and um, counters that'll go up and down with a touch of a button. And a lot of that stuff, while ergonomically making sense, really doesn't fit into at least today's universal design um, world because they're also specialized and so very expensive indeed. Um, and you'd use this if you had to. You probably wouldn't be able to sell this to a, a mainstream family unless they had a very particular um, understanding of, uh, of how they were using things. But that's out there. So, you know, just the high wall cabs, wonderful stuff. Really sits still in the assistive technology realm, in my opinion. It doesn't really fit the definition of what universal design is and what we'd find in our in our production universal, uh, excuse me, better living design home. Um, so here's the kitchen in the narrow deep house I showed you a few minutes ago that shows uh, some of the issues um, that we found that that you know take this away from steps away from um, what 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 might have been a, um, a kind of a universally a more universally designed more mainstreamed acceptable kitchen so the the yellow markers um, indicate uh, features which really don't meet our mainstream criteria you've got higher toe spaces which are um, uh, fairly specialized um, and that we wouldn't recommend in most mainstream homes for cabinetry. You've got a permanently open knee space below the kitchen sink. Unless you had someone who absolutely needed that, there's no point in having that into a home where you don't know if it's a, if it's a spec house, you don't know who's going to be moving in there. It's just kind of a demonstration. You could do that. Um, the, the green arrow is the front controls on the, on the range, which we like. We always like front controls on those. Uh, the blue arrow, I hope we don't have any folks with um, with the uh, color issues in their in their vision, for which I apologize. Uh, pointing at that uh, vent over the stove, um, we like vents over stove. We like externally vented vents over stove, um, uh, uh, over stoves because they they take all the toxins 
and smoke and such from stoves and vent them outside, which is where it belongs, doesn't belong floating around your house. We hope that that's an externally vented uh, vent. But the controls for that, of course, are an issue long term, if not short term, is how does someone reach that? Even someone who's just short, like my mom would have a hard time reaching that if she were still alive. Um, and so that's that's a long term issue that um, um, people may have solved more often than I have to come up with simple solutions to that. Uh, the the red arrow is is uh, pointing out a, a mixed bag. And so we wouldn't if this kitchen had a front control stove, it's obviously small, and had regular standard cabinets below the sink and and elsewhere, and had this. We we kind of like it, but we realize really that the marketplace is in terms of production home building really isn't probably ready for raised dishwashers as much as we wish it would be. Um, even though ergonomically we know that for a lot of people it works much, much better than floor mounted um, dishwashers. Um, but I don't know what people's experiences. We've designed them into several homes. This wasn't our particular design, but this designer happened to pick up on that. We like it. Um, it does present some challenges in terms of where you locate it. Obviously it has to be at the end of a end of a counter run and near the sink. Um, and we some someday perhaps people will will be able to choose that more effectively. Kind of like you can choose your front control, front loading clothes, washer and dryer and mount it up or mount it down on the floor. Lots of flexibility there, just like with dishwashers. You don't have to be restricted by one location. We um we gave some product awards a few years ago um, to two companies, Delta and Nest. Delta because they were the first manufacturer to bring the commercial touch-free faucet into the residential sector, and Nest because they were so far ahead of the rest of the pack at the time in their really vividly uh, uh, vivid displays on their their wall thermostat. You know, in an era back then with all these programmable thermostats that didn't work, you know, Nest was just stood out boldly. Now others have caught up in a lot of regards, but it still is an interesting product. Um, so we, we we should actually should do some awards again. And I should I'll be I'll be happy to kind of formulate a an advisory committee from some of the folks maybe listening today to um uh to help figure out what are the best new UD products. Um but this was twenty thirteen so it's kind of the wheel's turning now when you do that. But we like these two because while they're both kind of tech products and not cheap even now, um, they did represent steps forward in the in the residential sector. Now here's our bathroom on the second floor of that narrow footprint house. Um, that isn't perfect, but it's not huge either. And it, it does have a you know a a 30 by 60 shower, which you know is got a small curb there, really more narrow than we would recommend for most. That are that are non curb just because you have water splashing out and I think water containment would be an issue with that, but it's an interesting challenge in many cases. And this is not a renovation, obviously, but in many renovations, you're yanking a tub out, you want to put a shower in. There's a lot of constraints over how big you can get that shower and what kind of shower you might want to choose to put in there. So you've got that. You've got a, a toilet mounted in the corner, which is good. Lots of maneuvering room around it, and we can't see in this picture is that it's got um, actually this sink and a counter with some knee space underneath and they're using that knee space at least temporarily for some rolling storage so that's kind of an interesting way of using otherwise it might not be usable space so on we um we, we like um in this picture you see a, a soap dish by invisia and we like invisia stuff we've been courting them for years to get them to start advertising through our <laughs> social media marketing without success um but they've spawned, I think, a whole other um, alteration in the in the bath hardware industry, which you see many more people coming in now. It began with better looking grab bars years ago, and then these kind of non-grab bars, handholds, I, I call, wouldn't call them a grab bar in front of people again, because um, so many folks have a visceral reaction. I think the ideal bathroom has lots of grab bars in it, but so many people react against that. This is probably the next best thing to get people with sensible hardware installed and so you can see these it's nice design different finishes are available it's a soap dish you mount it in your shower or your tub you can mount a similarly designed elegant um, handhold around the mix valve around the toilet paper dispenser um, and also they make uh, kind of nice 
towel slash grab bars. So you can take out all your flimsy little grab bars and replace them with stuff that looks nice like this. So the towel gets hung below, which is kind of clearly defined by the design. And then up above is where your hand can go if you need to rest it while you're taking your shoes off or whatever you're doing in the bathroom. So we like stuff like that that um, is highly functional, yet is clearly something that folks might gravitate towards from an aesthetic perspective and then everyone's going to be better off. Um, just a, just a, a kind of a drop-in example of, um, of a, really an old idea for us, a three-way bathing area where you can walk in, roll in, shower standing, shower sitting, uh, transfer to the bench on the opposite wall, slide over into the tub if you want to, you know, reachable controls on the, um, on the tub, reachable controls on the, in the, in the shower area, um, all in one contained space. So you have a lot of functionality there, whether you, you know, prefer to bathe in a tub or don't want to, you've got both options available. In most people's bathrooms, uh, you know, if you have two bathrooms, our recommendation is, you know, one of them should probably be a curbless shower and one of them should probably be a tub. And you can figure out how to kind of work that out later on if you've got that opportunity. I thought I'd show you also in this, in our discussion here, you know, some stuff in the affordable housing sector, because it's easy to get lost in higher priced products and higher priced design examples and features um, and forget that it's even, it's possible to do a lot, not everything in a, on an affordable scale. This is some of the work we've done with uh, Habitat for Humanity, where we really were trying to work within the footprint of the home. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I see that Sandra's got a, a comment about barn doors. Yeah, we love barn doors and pocket doors. You'll see those coming up. Um, is that is that a product award? A product? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, I've got... I, I, uh, Karen, can you capture all these comments for later? Is it, or does it go away when the Yeah, no, I can share them with you later. Okay, good. Because I, 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 I'd love to to follow up on some of these. Um, so this is a small Habitat for Humanity house, and our challenge was keep the footprint the same because that's one of the big you know, price factors and see if you can improve what happens. So we we, we provided a step-free entrance. We got a bermed uh, walkway and a, and a you know, porch with a roof over it that's the same level as the first floor. Um, and you see here's a two-bath situation, two really small bathrooms, uh, one, Three fixture bath, one two fixture bath, and a laundry area. Just not much space in those. And you know, you might be thinking, how are we gonna, how are we gonna make a change here? Um, and so we we changed in two areas. We redid that whole zone of the bathrooms, um, and then slightly enlarged the kitchen as well. I didn't mention that, but we enlarged the kitchen to give a little more space inside there for multiple cooks, frankly, and as well as for people who might be using equipment at some time. Um, and uh, uh, so what we did is we had we made one bathroom even smaller, which is the master master bath, and one bathroom slightly bigger, um, and had an outswinging door. So we think that we improved um, the utility of that. And you can see that bathroom is not large. You could switch it from a tub to a shower, which would be possible, um, and it really doesn't have terrific accessibility or transfer capacity. But whoops, sorry but it is better than it was before. So we thought that within some real limitations of cost and floor area that um, we made an improvement um, over what was before. So it is possible. You can really do this in an affordable sector. Now here's another Habitat house, different design, more of a square design, which is frankly somewhat easier to work with because you can monkey around with your locations of rooms, kind of a, around a radius idea um, more than you can with a, with a longitudinal linear um, plan. And uh, so we changed a lot of locations of walls and closets and so on, really with not a net change in space much, just moving things around. So you gain some space in one location, lose some space in another. So the net net really isn't much of a change, except for the reorganization. So we wind up with these two bathrooms, another half bath, but we used um, pocket doors. And um, my, 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 take on this is that um, we used to not um, not recommend pocket doors for a long, long time because of their lack of reliability. Uh, we changed that when they came out with the kind of more standard two-roller hung pocket door. Um, and so we're 
currently still advocating them, or the barn doors, which somebody mentioned uh, uh, earlier. Um, uh, and um, um, so that makes this a more doable project with two pocket doors that don't take up that swing space. So we like those doors. Interestingly, barn doors are a sticky issue for bathrooms, of course, because one of the things I found with barn doors is that the acoustic privacy, which for some of us in bathrooms is so important, um, is is more absent. Um, you know, pocket doors has a little bit of a problem there too. For master bedroom access, it may not be much of an issue, but for for public um, access to a bathroom, it may want to think about a different option. So I've got a question here about front loading stacking washer dryer with adjustable height storage and rods. Don't quite get all of that adjustable height storage and rods or clothing processor that washes and dries. Oh yeah. I love those single units where you put in dirty clothes and you take, you bring out dry, clean clothes. You know, small capacity, probably no more expensive than a washer and dryer together, and they're all front-loading, front controls that I've seen. I just don't haven't seen many people with them, um, but that's an interesting idea to save space. In fact, we may want to do that in my house. Got this space. So um, moving on, so we can kind of get through here. It's, it's after nine now. Um, you know, beginning really 30 years ago, I began hearing stories about there being a demographic tipping point. And every year, every year someone's talked to me about, um, you know, it's going to be this year or we think it's already happened and where's the tipping point? Finally, the demographics are so, so overwhelming that it'll begin to dominate the market and that uh, in housing in particular, um, that uh, the change will be sweeping and we'll have lots of people demanding these kinds of features in homes and the builders will inevitably have to respond or lose market share, lose business to others. Um, and we've come to know that we're not uh, selling smartphones, that we're not, that we're, the home design features we're talking about just simply aren't as inherently attractive to people as smartphones, even though we know that the home tech that we also like so much that are terrific companions to um, BLD homes or universally designed homes uh, can often be operated using your smartphone, even for grandma. Um, so while there's some great crossover and we, we I like to boost the home, the simple home tech and the expanding home tech applicability, um, we're just not, it's not the same thing. We're not really in the, in the, in the kind of viral growth area of that. So that's why the, the issues I mentioned earlier in terms of demand, in terms of lack of government involvement and encouragement, lack of financial incentives, I think are so important because we need to try different things in the face of a lack of a tipping point that seems to be no closer now than it was before and the lack of perceived consumer demand. Although we've tried other things. So this is our favorite quote again stolen from ARP that from Henry Ford, if we waited around for someone to ask for a car, we'd all still be getting around in horse and buggies. True enough for cars, which I think in their day were perhaps like the, the smartphones. Everybody wanted one, and uh, they uh, their growth and popularity grew uh, grew immensely. And we've tried to help as many builders as we can, and I know others on this call um, have too, is to to you know build it and they will come to have supply led demand kind of dominate, and it just hasn't worked out yet. Um, we've seen small growth, but not the not the phenomenal growth that would even remotely attempt to catch up to the demographics. Um, oh, Shoshana, <laughs> I see. Sandra, Sandra's a nice name, Shoshana. Maybe you could. Maybe okay. there's a message there. Maybe you need to. Maybe you need to change it. Um, good to good to hear you and good to see you. Um, so we've tried this. We've tried you know supply side stuff, I educating the industry and. Consumers simply haven't been prepared to consistently reward people for getting into the area, and folks have, you know, too often kind of gotten it muddled, and so they they put out kind of good-looking, accessible design, calling it universal design, and wondering why mainstream consumers, you know, aren't aren't flocking to them. Well, it's because you've got the wrong stuff in there, and if you had fully integrated, high-function, but mainstream stuff, they would have had a better time. But even when we have those things out there, we just don't have people responding as much. I mean, you could you could muddle the design, muddle the construction, or muddle the marketing, and you know that. Oh, well, you can kind of you can slip up a number of different ways. So we've tried that. We've tried demand side tinkering by doing multitude demonstration. I think I've done 37 demonstration homes around the country, um, all with accompanying media hoopla. 
um, and increasing media attention. It's one thing we've seen over the decades is there are more and more articles about this issue, about aging, about finding places for older folks, about accessible housing, universal housing, a lot of it muddled. But still something is out there. There's far more attention to it than ever has been before. Um, hasn't succeeded in kind of changing uh, the whole uh, frame uh, for, the, for the industry. Um, so we we need more of this, you know. We we've we've done supply side stuff. We need to have more of it. We need to have supplier availability and have more products out there, um, maybe like um, like Karen stuff that's that's uh, that's available and ready to to meet people's needs. And we need to have a lot of demand side tweaking as well with with I think a robust long term campaign. Make it 20 years. Um, we need to have mortgage possibly mortgage finance tweaking. What about some pump priming mortgages that for maybe $10 billion over five or 10 years that would reward builders and home buyers um, for making the kind of choices we think will do a better job. We have other co others of our colleagues are now looking at US Treasury options to add to the um, deductibility of certain kinds of home modifications. Um, uh, hopefully UD as well, not, not just uh, home access stuff. Um, and oh, then, um, one of Hello? one of my clients once um, has recommended HGTV show, which would be wonderful mm. as well, as far as helping we, people change, you know, their mindset and how they think of things. Great, a great idea. We've seen dozens of those shows, haven't we? That have the kind of pity factor in there. Oh, this poor child or the poor, and you know, that's that's our work, all of us. We deal with this all the time, so we're kind of maybe I'm less moved and more cynical about that, but we'd like to move away from the let's help out this poor hapless family that to, hey, this is, you know, this is a great house for, for this family or that family or any family. I love to see more of that stuff. And if anybody has a, you know, the phone number of, um, yeah, Lisi, um, <laughs> the phone number of the producers of any of these shows, I actually met one once and they just went on, you know, blank stare when I started talking about our stuff. They just, you know, no one's, no one's yanking their chain about it. Um, anyway. So lots of work needed, supply side, demand side, and I think in particular, we can all agree, all great movements have a famous spokesperson, right? We need a famous spokesperson, someone without any identifiable connection to any of these issues, someone not old, someone not disabled, someone not young, someone not overly fit, someone not underly fit, just a regular person. And if, uh, you know, notwithstanding people's um, kind of sports affiliations, I would like to recommend the wife of uh, Tom Brady, Giselle Bunchen. Um, perfect, right? She was in the news, I think, in the Olympics a couple of years ago. She's always in the news with Tom Brady. Why not? Let's get her involved in this. She has no particular issue with it. And um, that's just my vote. You may have your own your own vote. Uh, for uh, <laughs> Sheila keeps saying Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> you know, that's the Coral Reefer Band might be a great backup band for our next conference. I'd love to to do that anyway um we got the, uh, the famous spokesperson the agreed objectives part is where we come in uh we can supply we think a realistic achievable design criteria um that everyone can understand and get behind um and we also need research though we need people who just who aggregate research not not just folks who are doing it but who can pull it together then translators who can take that research and put it into policy statements to affect local, state, and national policymakers to help kind of spur this on. It's not going to be one thing. Here is um, um, anyway. So that's that's a very quick scan of the of you know some of the things I think are needed to make this work better. This is uh, a version of a document that you, uh, that Karen will make available to. We have a, an updated version of this. That's actually our our essential level, which is our base level criteria. Now the other slideshow I've got, which we're probably not going to get to today takes you through this in detail so because we can't do that I'll kind of talk through this slide while we're looking at it here um, uh, and 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 it, it the essential level doesn't go into the level of detail that we'll get to with the next two levels because we have three tiers um, of this and this is just what gets you in kind of metaphorically in <laughs> get your toe in the door um, of this but um, with all of these features we've we've got in here, which will have to be accompanied by extensive additional material to explain what it is we mean, right? You're not going to build based upon this. It's just a little quick checklist. But um, 
the success of someone achieving these particular design objectives um, and dimensional requirements and so on really is dependent upon whether it looks good and not just work well, but does it look good? Um, we're, we're talking about you know features that are integrated and designed in and invisible to a large part, um, um, and that's that's really where the rubber beats the road. We we we'd love to start granting um, approvals to houses in 2018 or 2019 um, and go from there. But so we've got, uh, just to go through this quickly, we've got you know, entrance issues, interior circulation issues, bathrooms, kitchens, laundries, switches, controls, and hardware, power and home technology, interior environmental quality and maintenance. Those are our fundamental areas that we address, obviously, in more detail, more robustly at the higher levels of achievement. But even basically, you, you, you can't get a BLD approval without having at least one step free entrance into, into the house and a bunch of other collected criteria that need to be met with. Um, inside the home, you know, we like you to limit the number of hallways you have. And if you've got them, have them wider than um, you would ordinarily. I mean, the, the, the hallway width in my old house was 36 inches. Um, and so 42 inches is better, not perfect. 48 is even better. Um, and then entry door um, width, which would be larger. You could go bigger than this. I don't really recommend any longer 36 inch wide doors and every doorway for all parts of the house, just because it's a, it's difficult to make a big wide door with an eight foot ceiling look and feel like a, a typical residential home, it feels more like an office. And so if you have a nine or 10 foot ceiling, you get away with a three foot wide door. With an eight foot, five, eight foot high ceiling, you may wanna pick and choose where you put those wider doors and then make do with 32 inch wide doors if, if you can. We're pretty liberal in bathrooms. We don't make you have a fully accessible three fixture bath on the first floor of your house. We give you options conversion options, right? Kind of the easy adaptability options. Again, to broaden our capture as wide as possible and to make adaptability within people's reach, um, but to not mandate in every house. Obviously, we prefer to have a fully accessible free fixture bath, but um, if you can't do that, we give you other options of how you could work that. In, in, in kitchens, you can go so far down the road towards more full functionality with the existing options, it really is just picking and choosing things. So in the base level, um, we're not requiring, uh, for instance, multiple counter heights that you get to that later. It's very tough to achieve in a small kitchen. Um, so we do require some other things like maneuvering room and some layered lighting and full extension drawers and some other stuff. Um, even in laundry, we don't require that you have the laundry on the, on the main level. It's preferred, but if you've got some um, some rough in uh, that is um, that is in place where you can move laundry, maybe it's in the basement now. You can move you can move it up to the the first floor later. That's fine. We want to encourage multi-story houses, encourage houses not just slab on grade or not just with um, crawl spaces, but also with full basements. And so we want to give people that option to do that. So so you know uh, at first occupancy it's pretty good, not perfect, and you can make adaptions pretty easily. Um, switches, controls, and hardware. We opted for high visibility thermostat and a reachable electrical panel. We think that's a, one of these key locational decisions that are so often kind of forgotten about. You know, so many people's electrical panels are, you know, tucked away behind something in a closet. We want to pull it in a place. In my current home, it's right in the kitchen, which is kind of a aesthetic challenge, but we're trying to work around that. It's also mounted too high. So we need to, I'm not sure we can change that short term. Yes. Just real quick, if you want to check out the chat box, it says, um, Jenny says she has a project right now, a new build that they may want to look at better living design approval. Um, if what's doing, the bill? What's the what? It's a new build. It, oh, okay. Oh, project right now. Fantastic. Yeah, and Lacey asks, will you be training people to conduct these inspections to award the Better Living Design designation? For example, if there's a house in South Dakota that wanted to be considered. I would have to travel there, Lacey, personally. I want to go to, especially if it's in the western part of the state where you are, I would, that would mandate that all homes be visited by me personally, if only to get myself out there. Um, at least once in my life. Yes, we will be training people. We will, I mean, the whole idea is we want, you know, obviously uh, 
the financial viability of the whole operation is is key. Training individuals who can then go do these um, inspections where required is crucial. We're also toying with the idea of how about what's a remote uh, system look like? Uh, would taking video, would providing blueprints, um, uh, would providing the spec sheet? I mean, uh, how far could we go to not have to have every home visited personally by somebody and still be able to award them and approval. So we're going to work on that. I'd love to have people's opinions on whether that's possible. But yeah, inevitably, other folks will have to be trained and we'll have to have that that system in, in place. Thanks for that question. Sorry, I'm not looking more aggressively at the at the chat box. And thanks, Karen, for, uh, yeah, I'll for just try to keep you alerting up. me to this. Sure. Well, feel free to interrupt with other questions because we're nearing the end of our time and the end of my slides as well, which is fortunate. Um, so indoor environmental quality, a big deal. Um, uh, the, the ventilation is one of my big kind of issues now is I'm in my 60s now. One of my weak points in my in my health is, is my respiratory tract. And I'm acutely aware that my gas stove was not designed with an externally vented vent over it. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm coughing just thinking about it. Um, uh, and that 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 careful venting is important, and careful attention to makeup air is important. We don't have all those things in the in the essential level, but we're 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 including this as one of the criteria with some some base level things. And then um, we have maintenance in there also because we think maintenance should be a criteria that's included for you know for evaluative purposes. So hard surface uh, flooring or low pile carpeting is what we're putting in there for that to. Um, um, make that more doable and more achievable long term. So that's that's the basics for this. Again, the other levels get to be uh, more detailed and more robust. And obviously, if you get to the middle and top level, you got a pretty universally designed house, both ergonomically and otherwise. So there's a much more appropriate, I think, uh, representation of the range of people you might find, unlike our alien force before. Um, and uh, sometimes I say relax when people get to this point because it just, you know, we know that everyone, that there's a lot of variation in human form and performance and it's just there. So you might as well design around it and plan for it and not get too upset about it. This is a nice uh, development and I think it's in the West Coast somewhere. It's got nice pathways that are pretty accessible. Now I'm going to wind up here, just got minutes left here with, um, with our social media platforms, which we're pushing hard all the time. We have been for about a year now. We keep getting more and more things happening. But um, with the U UDI, um, the Mason Universal Design Institute, which is the umbrella organization, we've got Facebook and then Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and I think we have more. We add all, all the time. But please, you know, look us up there and follow us. We'd be happy to follow you back. But a living design has even more. Um, Facebook, um, Twitter, we're in House, we're in Pinterest. We'd love to be keeping posting new ideas there. And we're also on Instagram, which is um, a foreign animal to me, but my uh, young person who helps with this insists that we have to be in this platform. So I would uh, I would ask you please to sign up for those. And also, we, if you want to get our newsletter, which is twice a month, Send me your email. If I don't already have it, I don't have a lot of folks' emails. Send it to me so we can get this to you direct in your inbox uh, twice a month with, you know, it's really a digest of timely news from the internationally, nationally, stuff that we're doing. Keep you abreast of what's happening. Um, it's really good stuff. There's where we are now. Asheville is a great town to visit. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting out an invitation now. I'm just saying it. Um, we'd love to host people if they'd like to come. Um, and that is the end of the presentation. So again, we've gone through um, this very quick recitation of what Better Living Design is all about, why it exists, the continual problems in the industry with understanding what's going on and the lack of demand that's all resulted in this lack of production so that finding homes, I mean, it's just difficult for anybody um, now, unless you're looking at multifamily or you have the money to go into these age-restricted communities. Um, <laughs> Sheila reminds me. <laughs> yes, I, I was remiss. Sheila O'Connor is on my board of directors, and she is an Yay. occupational therapist. So <laughs> she's um, not my first allied health professional, but she is my first OT. So that's a, that's that's no note, noteworthy. You're um, becoming classy. Begin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Give you a little, little um, dimension of class. So Sandra Shoshana is asking for, yeah, I think that this is available. Uh, Karen, I know that you make all these things available, right? Afterwards. Yeah, uh, um, I'm going to try to get, I will I'm try, it takes me a little while to reformat the presentation. So I, it usually takes yeah. me a week or so to get them up, but okay. I try to do as fast okay. as I can. All right, that's fine. So uh, that's our quick recitation. We we obviously have more we could do, and, and I'll be happy to to entertain any other thoughts. I've got you know 25 slideshows on various topics, but I see you've got so many that have already happened. You've got I think you've had things on bathrooms and kitchens and so on. But I'll be happy to bring back, come back and do a thing just on bathrooms from a UD perspective, or just kitchens or whatever. That would be so wonderful. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Hey, Jackie asks. Um, did you say better living design is a subset of universal design? Uh, well, it in 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 two ways, yes. The Better Living Design Institute is in fact nested under the Universal Design Institute, so in that sense, it's it's directly below that. But in in another sense, programmatically, um, better living design is universal design focused just on the one, two, and three family housing sector. So UD, you know, covers this huge, vast expanse of not just the built environment, but the designed environment, right? Left and right, educational pedagogy, um, you know, public buildings, transportation systems, web. Uh, BLD is just, we, that's why residential areas is special enough and different enough, we decided that it deserved its own organization and its own focus and attention <clears throat> to help move things along. So, Karen, what else? I think we've got it. Um, in fact, we will probably ask you to come back again and discuss um, kitchens or bathrooms or anything you want to discuss, actually, Richard, because sure. you always have such great information. It'll be really <clears throat> interesting to see where the better living design um, concept goes. And yeah, of course. Let's see, because, I mean, that really is not as... It's really a great way to describe changing your home to make it so it is easier and more accessible. Yeah, and again, we decided to to adopt that nomenclature so we could kind of put all the confusions with the universal design to one side a bit and say, okay, you can you can discuss universal design all you want, whether what is what isn't, but here's what better living design is. And if you design your home this way, boom, you'll have all these advantages and features. Definitely. Okay. And I have one more. Uh, well, Lacey says, uh, really sure. gets at one of the problems I've seen in research. Universal design is an abstract concept. Yeah. Uh, so, she, uh, so, Lisa, you thought my, my presentation kind of fleshed out what might otherwise be considered to be abstract. Okay, good. That's good. That, that was the idea. I mean, I, uh, my first presentation <clears throat> did go through the principles and tried to tie it to, to examples, but clearly I'm not, I don't really do teach principles that often because um, you know, builders aren't building principles. They're building door widths and they're building counter heights. And that's what we try to talk about. Let's go out. Um, one last thing. We were talking about HGTV. Um, I don't know. Some of you know. Uh, I, had a, I did a presentation recently and the woman um, contacted HGTV. And here I just put in the chat box the... Um, the email address of the man who's in charge um, that she found who's in charge of helping with program development. So if anybody has a little extra time, send this guy a, a note, you know, who knows who he'll choose if he does choose to do something like um, a better living design or universal design or aging in place design, what, you know, whatever it's going to be called for the show. But, you know, give them a call. Send them an email. We might as well rattle their cage a little bit and see if we can get this more in the mainstream because I I know that a, a lot of us struggle with, you know, people saying, for instance, I talked to an old friend the other day and I asked him how he was doing. He told me he was an invalid. He can hardly move. And I talked to him about setting his house up, you know, so he could move and making it so it was safe. And he's like, oh, no, I'm fine. So, <laughs> yeah. Maybe if we can kind of make that a little more mainstream, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Well, have a wonderful night, everyone. And uh, for the Hamoda members, we'll see you the first Monday of February. It's coming up soon. So.
Take care. Okay. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard.